is Rogers TV, Durham Region. The opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of Rogers nor Rogers TV. Hello everyone, this is your COVID-19 local update for Tuesday, July the 21st, 2020. I'm Deborah Hutchison in the Rogers TV studio. Joining us first up today is Bill Holmes. He is the general manager of Durham Transit. Welcome to the show, Bill. How are you? Thanks, Deborah. We're, we're doing very well. We're, we're minding the heat, but uh, everyone's doing good so far. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about um, the safety measures um, that you have had to put in place in response to COVID-19 and your response to COVID-19. It certainly has been uh, a challenging four months for, for Durham Transit. Um, your ridership has, sure. has dropped a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was, that was the first thing that happened, correct? And that was really the impetus. Uh, you know, we've actually, um, and I heard a stat today, it's been six months since uh, COVID sort of came to Canada and the Toronto area. So we've really been dealing with this and monitoring and preparing for, for the past six months. Um, and when it first hit in, in mid-March uh, very hard, that's where we saw the, uh, um, the the significant drop in our ridership. And, and during those first weeks, we were actually down between 70 to 80% uh, in our ridership as people were staying home and, and not traveling. Um, so it was very significant. Um, you know, the one key that we did find and, and where we, we have to, as a society, keep focused on is, is the essential workers throughout our region continue to rely on, on Durham Reader Chant to, to get to the homes, to get to the hospitals. And um, they really uh, supported us through that first uh, few weeks and a couple of months and, and making sure that uh, we were still able to support them. Um, and it was crucial in those early days that uh, the proper message were taken. And, and to this day, some of those initial steps that we we took um, in terms of the physical distancing, the rear door boarding, um, to make sure that there was space between the operators, the suspension of our fares uh, in support of uh, operator safety as well. Um, those were the key uh, processes that we put in place that ensured uh, both the safety of our bus operators and the safety uh, of our customers who were continuing to use our service. Now you say um, you, you suspended your fares, why? Once we moved to rear door boarding, and, and it was very crucial for us that, uh, you know, without a bus operator able to drive the bus, uh, we don't go anywhere. So we had to make sure that our staff were safe and secure um, and, and that they could continue to operate the service for the essential workers that we talked about. So as part of that, and, and like many uh, agencies across the province, we, we moved to a rear door boarding. Um, and restricted access to the front of the bus so that the operator could be uh, continue to work without um, concerns of uh, having their physical distancing uh, uh, encroached upon. So as part of that, with our fare box at the front of the bus, we did have to forego fares for those first few months um, until we were able to put in place the appropriate mechanisms to support driver safety, which which we have done. And, and once we started resuming fares on July the 2nd, um, you know, and if you're on a bus today, you will see those bio barriers. Um, that is a physical barrier like we see when we go to the grocery store or other stores these days that, that protects the operator um, uh, from any potential exposure from customers who are boarding the bus. What has that meant, I guess, for um, your your bottom line and the, the drop in revenue? So uh, we we were losing just over four hundred thousand dollars in revenue per week, um, and, and that was from mid March through until we started to resume fares uh, in July. Uh, we still are, are seeing a significant reduction in revenue um, as a result of the reduced ridership. So uh, today we're we're carrying approximately. 40% of what we carried last summer. Um, but we also have our significant partnership with our local post-secondary institutions, Ontario Tech, Durham College, um, and Trent University. And, and the UPASS program that we have with them is, is significant, both from a ridership and a revenue perspective. And, and as we can all appreciate, those uh, institutions had to uh, readjust and, and uh, also uh, are providing a lot of virtual learning, which means a lot of students aren't traveling. So we've just agreed with them that we would um, uh, pause the agreement we had, which again is a further impact to uh, to our revenues and, and our losses for this year. So uh, you know that's really one of the biggest issues we're dealing with 
now and, and looking forward to 2021, um, you know, we're taking steps now to make sure that um, as ridership returns, as our economy recovers, um, that we're in a good position to continue to uh, put service back into place and, and support residents when, when they're going to need public transit the most moving into 2021. Have you had any layoffs as a result? We have. We we had uh, we've had two levels of service reduction since mid March. Um, the first we dropped about twenty percent, and and then we've dropped a further eighteen percent a little later on. And, and at that point, we were required to lay off um, approximately forty one of our staff. Uh, but we did work very closely with our partners at Unifor, and and we had a number of employees come forward. Um, uh, with voluntary layoffs, which really helped uh, our numbers and, and supported those employees as well. So um, at this point in time, those employees continue to be laid off and, and we are looking forward to our phase A of our service plan that we're putting in place in response to the pandemic, which we're very excited about. Uh, we feel it's gonna provide a, a much more effective and, and uh, quicker service for customers traveling within the region um, and really respond to those travel needs that we've seen that, that have changed. Um, and as that Part, we'll, we'll be reevaluating our staff requirements oh. um, uh, in, in advance of that uh, August 24th date. Okay, let, let's talk about that, that phase A service plan, um, your restoration plan. Uh, what does that mean for riders? You say that, um, you know, ridership trends and, and the demand has, has changed and this is how you're responding. Overall, what will it mean? Yeah, so so we saw early on, and, and it continues to this day, the, the pre-COVID um, service pattern that we had is we had a very high demand in the morning as people were traveling to work and traveling to school. And then we also had an increasing demand in the afternoon as people were returning from work in the office and returning from school. And uh, as we know, that that's not the case today. Um, and so our, our service demand has really changed. And, uh, you know, we see sort of a steady increase through the day into the afternoon. Um, some agencies are just relaying back on what they took off um, so that their service looks very much like pre-COVID days. Um, but we're taking a, sort of an innovative approach here um, and, and we're making sure that the service we're putting back into place um, is available to all residents of the region and is really addressing those changes in demand that we're seeing. So we're gonna see a, a combination of scheduled service that we've seen before with our frequent network uh, service every 15 minutes or better, um, such as the Pulse and, and our route on the 915, the 401. And then we also have our, our grid system, which is uh, every 30 minutes. Um, and, and what we're doing that's a little different than others is we are really expanding our on-demand services. So in those areas where demand is low right now, um, you'll still be able to access public transit and get to where you need to go very uh, effectively and, and cost effectively. Um, and then as ridership returns, we'll continue to grow the scheduled service and, and on-demand will, will also be there to support us. So we feel it's a, a great opportunity for um, us to meet those specific demands of our, our ridership throughout the region. And also for people who may um, have not thought of DRT in the past, uh, that you know we're really uh, looking forward to new customers coming on board and, and choosing to travel through the day because the service will be more efficient, uh, easier to access. Uh, we're moving with, uh, with our on-demand service as well and with an app so people can plan and schedule and even uh, at some point, hopefully in the early fall, will be able to pay for their trip at the same time. So it really is much more convenient um, and tailored to the needs of our residents here in Durham. And of course, masks are mandatory when you ride uh, Durham Transit. One of the one of the key issues that we we continue to push, and, and I think you know our staff have been just fabulous through the entire this entire process, um, in terms of putting in place and supporting all the safety measures, both for themselves and, and our staff, but also for our customers. And uh, you know we we put all of the mechanisms in place. We've got all of the policies and requirements, uh, which does include wearing a mask. And, and we hear a lot in the media um, of transit agencies and, and regions in general requiring masks to be worn. And, and DRT is no different. Um, uh, if you see a bus go by or you get on a bus or pass a bus shelter, you'll see some very unique um, advertising there really promoting the use of masks. Um, and we're, we're looking to our passengers to, to do what they need to do now um, to make sure that we continue to be safe and provide that safe alternative for them and, and, our, and their fellow passengers. Um, so masks are mandatory um, uh, on the bus. Uh, the operator won't be enforcing it, um, but you know we are reminding people of, of what that requirement is uh, to have a mask on when they are using DRT. And we've also taken the extra step of uh, we are installing uh, hand sanitizer stations on the bus as well. And while we, we do hope that 
passengers bring their own hand sanitizer and, and use that uh, as frequently as possible. For people that may have left it at home or forgot it that day, we, we will have that on the bus as well um, as a further step in, in supporting passenger safety. Uh, and we're just hoping the passengers take make the right decisions uh, when, when they're using our service. You know, if people check out your website, there is a very clear list of expectations that you have um, for those that, that ride ride the buses and um, the etiquette. And as you said, bus operators uh, are not expected to enforce, but you will call police if necessary. So what, one of the things we've always been sensitive um, about the mask issue, and, and you know, we've I'm sure people have seen the, the YouTube videos of uh, in various commercial establishments where it's, as sometimes it's, it's a struggle with some customers who um, uh, will not wear a mask. And, mm -hmm. and we're very sensitive to that. Um, that's why we're taking the, an approach of education versus penalties. Um, so our, our operators will remind people um, to wear the mask. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're not calling the police if someone doesn't wear a mask. Um, but if there is a disturbance on the bus and, and it is creating a situation for other customers, that's that's when our operators will step up like they do all the time. And if there's a, an issue on the bus um, that could result in a safety concern for anyone, they were quick to call police and, and they show up right away, um, they would support us if there is any of those general disturbances on the bus where uh, a customer just um, is ignoring what those safety requirements are. Okay, Bill, we're almost out of time, but I do want to mention you're providing free Presto cards to customers. We are. We've uh, one of the safety mechanisms um, that we have put in place, and, and from the advice of the Ministry of Transportation, was to promote contactless fare payment. Um, and as part of that, uh, while we still uh, will permit cash to be used. Uh, we're really encouraging people to use Presto because it is more cost effective. Um, you save 75%, 75 cents a ride or $10 for every 14 trips. Um, and as part of that, we had 4,000 free Presto cards that we've been giving out at our points of sale location since early July. And, and I can say that as of yesterday, we still have 750 free Presto cards that are available. Um, all you need to do is visit our point of sale location um, and you can load those cards either there or at any shopper's drug mart in the region um, or a go station as well. And, and again, it's an affordable way uh, to be able to, to use DRT services uh, versus cash. Uh, in your general manager's uh, report, you, you did note there's been um, a real increase in vandalism. Why do you think that is? Well, um, I, I, I won't comment on the reasons, but I will make the comment that, you know, from time to time, we do experience vandalism across the system, and that generally results in uh, shelter glass being being damaged or broken. Um, and it's a significant issue for us in that it creates both a safety concern for our customers mm -hmm. trying to use that shelter, and, and there is a, a significant cost to us and to the region in having to go out and repair that. So, so we are working with our supplier to, to look for uh, solutions that will better withstand vandalism. Uh, but in the meantime, in some of these areas where we are seeing a little more frequent increase in it, uh, we are going to pause replacing the glass until we come up with a solution. Uh, hopefully that will be uh, more effective uh, moving forward into the future for us. Okay, we've only got about 30 seconds left, but on, I wanna end this on a positive note. Uh, a recent visit by Tim Hortons handing out donuts and coffee to your, your staff. How cool was that? It, it was exceptional, and, and, and DRT was selected as the uh, you know, the only transit uh, agencies that they were going to go to as their part of their promotion in, in supporting um, and saluting frontline staff. So it was really cool. to They brought in a, a, a trailer that served as a drive through and we had buses and staff that were driving through for uh, uh, their shot of fame, and, and their we were talking earlier this morning about uh, how widely they're utilizing that campaign through social media. So we were really excited to uh, to host them. Um, and I know our staff had a great thrill at uh, participating in that and, and uh, supporting that activity. Okay, Bill Holmes, General Manager of Durham Transit. Thanks so much for joining us. Stay with us, more to come after the break. As a senior support coordinator at Durham Regional Police, I have the privilege of working with seniors and the organizations that serve them. Join me, Sergeant Deborah Anderton, along with Constable Daryl Rice on Seniors Talk as we put the spotlight on the issues that matter most to seniors and their families. Safety, wellness, 
and family responsibilities are just some of the challenges that we'll tackle on Seniors Talk, only on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Local Update. Joining us now is Jeff Dornan of All or Nothing Brew House in Oshawa. Jeff, it's been a while since we've seen you. How are you doing? We're, uh, we're keeping busy and we're, we're happy uh, since we last spoke. It's obviously warmed up and the sun's come out, so we're, uh, we're excited for that. More than just the sun has come out. The last time we spoke with you, um, you had stopped making beer. You had converted to making hand sanitizer. Now you're back to making beer. How does that feel? We're, uh, we're excited to be uh, doing what we love most, which is obviously craft beer. Uh, we're excited to have the community back uh, at, uh, at the brewery. Uh, having people on our patio again uh, has brought uh, a little bit of normalcy to, uh, to an interesting time. So we're, uh, we, we have a lot to be thankful for. Now, are you continuing to make the hand sanitizer or is that finished now? We're still uh, we're still distributing it. We haven't produced it as regularly. Uh, Health Canada has uh, has released uh, lots of licenses, so there's there's a kind of a whole cottage industry of producers right across the country, which is fantastic to see. So that uh, there's no shortages anymore uh, that we've at least heard of. So that's good. But uh, we're still selling little bits here and there for people that can't quite find it. Um, but it's definitely slowed down, which we're we're happy to see in some regards. Um, that uh, people are now able to uh, to get the products that they need to stay safe. So we're we're thankful for that. The the process you had to install your distillery in order to make the hand sanitizer. Um, so you haven't dismantled it yet. Is there enough room for your beer making equipment and and the hand sanitizing equipment? Yeah, yeah, we still have the distillery hooked up. We won't uh, dismantle that. Uh, our tanks are now empty. We were fermenting uh, sugar water to uh, produce the ethanol. And now we have a new form of sugar water that we would normally call wort, or uh, that's the, the liquid we make in our brew house that gets converted to beer uh, when we introduce our beer yeast to it. It ferments for about a week to two weeks uh, to create our, our delicious craft beer. So we've kind of gone from one, one sugar water to another. And uh, this one uh, uh, obviously uh, tastes a whole heck of a lot better uh, being uh, some delicious craft beer of all different flavors. Yes, it does. I can tell you. So when you decided to um, make the move and start producing the beer again, how long did it take to get that operation up and running? Uh, it took us about three weeks. Uh, most batches of beer take anywhere from two to four weeks to produce for uh, the styles that we make in house. Um, so it took a while to get back up and running. Uh, we obviously had to make sure the tanks were clean. Uh, getting the whole facility kind of reorganized back into our uh, our brewing process, um, just making sure everything was back uh, spick and span before we started back into the uh, into the beer world. So, so it took, took, took us about four weeks. At, at first, it was um, you know curbside pickup. Now you have a wonderful patio open because you're still not at this point that we are taping this July 21st. Um, customers are not coming into the the building itself, correct? It's been a bit of an evolutionary process. So obviously we were closed for the first couple of months and then uh, then we started up in uh, opening for curbside pickup, as you mentioned. Right. Uh, that slowly morphed into uh, being able to come inside for a socially distanced, uh, quick uh, in and out purchase of beer. Uh, we have our beers on display and people quickly kind of point and we have limited the amount of folks in the building to, uh, to three or four. Um, now that's obviously over the last two weeks has opened up into being able to have our patio open. Um, so that's been very, very popular kind of Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, we've started back into having food trucks on site uh, every Friday. So we uh, just last week had uh, a wood fired pizza. Uh, this week we're having um, a food truck called Ebony Bites, which is really delicious kind of Caribbean style jerk chicken. Uh, next week, we have a, uh, a gentleman uh, that's going to be doing some Brazilian food. So there's all sorts of uh, all sorts of really cool things going on on our patio. How long did it take to get the patio set up and to get the approval? Uh, the, the region and the city had expedited that whole process, correct? We were fortunate we had the patio last year. So this is coming into our second season with the patio. Um, I know some folks have had some challenges, but I have to thank the, uh, the city of Oshawa. They've been fantastic. 
uh, and very uh, supportive of uh, of our our endeavors. And anytime we have any sort of roadblocks, they'd be very quick to uh, to remove them. So we'd be very thankful for the city and, and also the region uh, of Durham. They've been uh, great champions of, of small business and uh, big supporters of ours. So we're thankful for that. So how many how, how does it work? Um, you know, do if you want to partake of the the patio, uh, are are you taking reservations? How are you controlling? Um, I guess the numbers. How many customers per table? Because it's real a real balancing act for those who are operating patios. Correct. It definitely it's definitely tricky. Uh, it's definitely a new um, new experience for us. We've never taken reservations before. Uh, we've done a bit of a blend of both. So we're uh, we're taking reservations online ahead of time. Uh, that's the easiest way to kind of secure your spot. We're also taking walk-ups, um, but to ensure that we're adhering to uh, the health codes by Durham, uh, Durham Health, uh, we are having to do uh, contact tracing. So when folks do come in that haven't made a reservation, uh, we are requiring them to, uh, to write on a piece of paper their name, email, phone number. Uh, we record the time uh, so that if there was ever any sort of outbreaks, we'll be able to do some contact tracing with uh, Durham Health uh, to ensure that uh, all those that were here at that point are able to be notified. But uh, so far, uh, we haven't had to uh, to use that, which is fantastic. Um, obviously, COVID is hopefully uh, on the uh, decline as it continues in Durham. So, um, yeah, we've been a, done a, a function of both, and it's been going well, but there's definitely been some growing pains, and, and we've worked through those over the last, uh, I guess, it's been uh, three, three plus weeks that we've been open now. What have been the growing pains? Uh, just trial and error, different software, staff training, um, getting the general public uh, used to kind of the new ways of before, you know, you just kind of hang out and you can share a picnic table. We're not able to do that now. If you come in with that group, you can't kind of mingle with other groups. Um, so just trying to keep those rules enforced and trying to keep everyone protected as being our, our number one goal. As well as uh, protection for, for staff, um, employees, any difficulty getting the required PPE that you've ne you've needed? Obviously, uh, hand sanitizer is not an issue for you. But what about the rest of it? Uh, we we've got uh, we've got lots of uh, PPE. I mean, I just I keep my pocket now. I got my uh, my face mask. I go never leave home without it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, uh, we're we have lots of uh, lots of that. We've provided that, and this was actually was made uh, locally up the road um, at. Uh, uh, one of the local clothing uh, manufacturers in Oshawa is Ford, the name off the head at the moment, but uh, they managed to make all the masks and we were happy to kind of help out uh, another local business as, as we've been helped out by the community uh, through purchasing beer. So what's working well for you? Um, if you had to look at this whole experience over the last few months, has there been an upside to this whole COVID experience? Uh, the only upside is it continually challenges us to find new solutions. Uh, but I, I can't think of uh, too many things, but we're always up for a challenge and, and to find uh, uh, you know, new, new solutions. So it's been a good problem solving for us. But uh, beyond that, we, are, we look forward to the days that uh, uh, we don't have to use the word COVID anymore in a, a sentence. But uh, we're thankful that we can have folks into the brewery again, enjoy them, uh, enjoy their time on the patio. Uh, we're looking forward to stage three uh, shortly coming to uh, the Durham region and, uh, and having uh, a bit more space inside, mainly for uh, if it's rain, um, or a rain day, uh, that's been a bit of a hampering on businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so we're really thankful to be able to have a bit of a flexible solution to bring people inside uh, if it were a rain day. But uh, we'll take that step uh, when it opens up to us uh, in the near future. So as we tape this on July 21st, um... This show is airing on Friday when we are expected to go to stage three. Uh, how will life change for you under stage three? We're, uh, we're going to do what we just did uh, in stage two. We're taking a wait and see approach. Um, we're going to, we don't need to, this is not a, a sprint by any means. Uh, it's more of a marathon approach. And so we don't feel that we have to uh, kind of open up uh, the inside right away. Uh, we want to see kind of what people's comfort levels are, uh, continue to obviously follow the direction of the health department and the provincial government. And uh, so we're, uh, we're gonna take a bit of a wait and see approach and probably open in the next kind of two or three weeks uh, once uh, some of the other folks have opened up and we'll, we'll let everyone kind of settle in and then slowly open our beer hall to uh, a socially distant experience. How many people can you fit inside? Good question. 
we can probably fit a similar amount to our patio. So our patio currently has uh, anywhere from six to eight picnic tables uh, out on it. So mm -hmm. with, if you were at full capacity of six people per table, uh, we can fit about 48 outside. Uh, inside would be similar. So kind of 36 to 40 people. Um, so uh, a, a good number, but not quite what we would normally have in, uh, in normal circumstances. Now you, you mentioned a great idea having food trucks there um, by your patio. Is that something you did last year as well? We did. Uh, we had uh, we weren't quite every weekend this year where we do have food trucks every Friday, which is uh, something we've been working towards planning through the winter. Um, so that was uh, that was something that worked out well last year and this year uh, it's been a great response so far. So we're really uh, uh, looking forward to continuing to add more days um, either through this year or in the next year. So it's been, uh, been really well received. We've only got about three minutes left, Jeff. Um, I did want to talk to you about when we were talking about the, the upside of this whole thing and it was, you know, it's, it's really challenging you and you're learning how to, I guess, move on the go and, and make changes on the go. Um, but has an upside been, I guess, the support that the small businesses have given each other? Because in the early stages, you, you really had a lot of support from other small businesses when you moved to making um, the hand sanitizer as well, did you not? That is a very good point. I, I um, do really do want to thank the community. The community has been a huge uh, supporter. Uh, we are seeing constant new faces uh, coming into the brewery uh, on a weekly basis. And so that's been huge. And we've been trying to figure out how to do things with other local community supporters. So uh, a great example, uh, we have a great partnership with Barry Hill uh, in downtown Oshawa. They've been a huge supporter of ours over the last seven years. And so we've been working with them. Uh, they were, as they reopened their patio, uh, they were implementing draft beer. And uh, we like to think of ourselves as uh, draft beer uh, experts or uh, know a thing or two about how to install a draft beer line and so we were helping them uh, get that up and running to help them uh, be as profitable and maximize their patio and uh, that's kind of morphed into they do a tea room at uh, at, Barry, at uh, Parkwood Estates yeah. and uh, which is a beautiful facility for those that uh, have not uh, been there unbelievable grounds and great history behind it and so uh, they've been buying beer for from us uh, at the uh, uh, for the tea house and the Parkwood Estates has been a big supporter. They're carrying our beer soap uh, in their gift shop. And so it's been a really good um, community effort, uh, give and take. Uh, let's help each other out and get through this together. So it's been a really cool kind of uh, uh, understory to this whole thing. Do you think this is a support system that will continue, you know, way after, uh, you know, COVID is a, is a word that we say on a daily basis? I, I would like to think so, and I, I strongly do believe so. Um, just it's a, some of the hardest parts in, in friendships and in relationships is just getting to know the people, and this mm. has been a great way to say, hey, neighbor, like, you know, how can we help? And uh, so we've opened up a lot of new doors and met a lot of new people in the community, and I think that's going to go a long way in the future. So we're really excited for uh, for what's ahead. I'm really excited that that your beer is there being offered at Parkwood. That That is absolutely awesome. It's really, I, I haven't had a chance to go over there yet, but uh, I've, I've done a couple of deliveries. It's been uh, selling selling well, and it'd be pretty cool to have a, a cold a cold beer on a hot Friday uh, beside that beautiful fountain they have uh, out back at the facility. Okay. Jeff Dornan from All or Nothing Brew House in Oshawa. Thanks again for joining us. All the best. Thanks for joining us today. Until next time, I'm Deborah Hutchison. Stay safe, everyone.